the other side perspective, it can be a very valuable tool, not least one that saves the need for letters points, um, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Thank you, thank you very much for this very illustrative and very interesting session. We break for lunch and we assemble back at 2.30. 2.30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is to try and... It's not exactly a disease. Motor, uh, locomotor disability is not, a, not exactly a disease which takes away from a person's mental capacity. Maybe it's just the way a person is not able to coordinate his movements properly. But that does not make him absolutely useless. He has a right to exist as a human being. He has a right to enjoy all the food, the rights which are guaranteed to, to, to other citizens under the Constitution. Then, along with the physical disabilities, which are, which were more apparent blindness, hearing impairment, another aspect also was was considered and looked into, and that was the the area of mental disability. The we had an old act which was there from British times known as the Indian Lunacy Act, 1912. That had certain provisions and there was a specific provision for people who took a defense of being not in possession. I recently had the occasion of going to one of the most premier institutions of mental health in India in a place called Ranchi in the district of Jharkhand. Uh, the place is associated with a very famous name, name of, of a doctor, his name, was, his name was Dr. Davis. He had started the, the, the institution. That, it is now known as the Central Institute of Psychiatry. There you have a person who is a very, very sensitive person as the director. One doctor, Alka. It was a marriage of two different communities and religions, but they worked it out so beautifully among between themselves, and they run the institution as if, as if it was like their own family, their own home. I had a chance to speak. In fact, on mental, world mental health care was there, Rachi, and we had a little um, a meeting kind, you could say, a little workshop with many of the inmates and the doctors. And we were told that a mental problem may not always be some people who can come back out of whatever depression or whatever they are facing and be productive citizens of the of the country. We went to the wards, we met the people, and there was exactly that. People who have returned to normalcy almost. So one, these protections have been provided for under the mental health act, so that people are able to get treatment and at the same time come out for the cure. There's a, there has been problems with the, the, the medical, the mental institutions at times when people having problems or disputes related to property, especially properties belonging to old people, widows, in order to try and get hold of the management of the property, to get hold of the property, you try and push a person into a mental institution and then forget about him or her. This has been a big, but much of this has not been now been tackled under the provisions of the Mental Health Act, where the certification is required, and without the certification, a person cannot be institutionalized. In 1993, again an exercise was undertaken by the United Nations for elimination of discrimination against persons with disabilities. Nothing came out of it, 
the United Nations adopted something which was a non-compulsory guidelines or standard rules on the equalization of opportunities for persons with disabilities, which ultimately led to one of the most important documents as far as people with disabilities are concerned, and that is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which was adopted on the 13th of December 2006. In fact, the, the, the core principle of the Convention reiterates all these questions of non-discrimination, equality of opportunity for men and women, and the right of disabled persons to full and effective participation and inclusion in society. Article 1 of the Convention explains the purpose of the Convention to promote and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities and to promote respect for the independent dignity. One of the important features of the Convention was to appeal to the members that it is society's duty to accept persons with disabilities as a part of a human existence is something which is, cannot be avoided. If there are unfortunate people who have these problems, it is society's, society's duty to not only accept them, but to help them out as much as possible. Here, once again, disability has been defined. I've discussed the, the I've set out the long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairments which in interaction with various factors may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. India was a member of the proclamation and uh, have adopted the convention and the rules set out therein. In fact, our Indian Constitution, I have spoken about Article 14 and 21, these are articles which come under the chapter what we call 38 falls in what is known as Part 4 of the Constitution which deals with the directive principles of state policy which do not enforceable are the guidelines for governance, the guidelines for the legislature deals with the government's duties to act in a manner so that people of all different classes of society are given equal opportunities. This is where the economic aspect comes in. This is a provision under which an enactment has been uh, an act has been enacted, known as the Legal Services Authorities Act, which provide for providing free legal aid, providing free legal aid. This particular act also provides that this body can, if necessary, take up issues relating to human rights, problems which are being faced by human beings, citizens in the country, and to take up their causes by way of something known as social justice litigation. You may be familiar with the concept of public interest litigation. This act provides for social justice litigation where the, 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 not only the national body but the state bodies can also participate and take and file litigation who is the head of a particular department of this kind, social welfare. He has no contact with the grassroots people. <coughs> He has no contact with the ground level. He has no idea what's going on at that level. But he is to implement and make policies. These are some of the things which one think about, thinks about as one goes about reading about these matters, dealing with these matters. What we require are people who are sensitive. What we require is a kind of a general education, legal education, awareness for people, to make them aware that this is an area which can succeed and where you can really do something if you are sensitized and committed. Without these aspects, and unless you are sensitized, there's no point. A disabled person suffering from palsy, cerebral palsy, have to cover a long distance to reach the courts, to reach his office. 
And that was taken up as a cause. And thereafter, if the court's friends said, no, this is something which should be addressed, and he should be given employment somewhere closer, he should be appointed there. Then you had another aspect, you had the, the case of Chandan Panik, where some other means. Like I had said at Dubai earlier, both uh, Mr. Carlos Gonzalez and I, we had came to consider section 32 and 33 of the Disability Act of 1995. In the case of a, a primary teacher, a primary teacher whose name was Bashiruddin? Bashiruddin. Bashiruddin. This uh, was a case keep reserved post-spot people suffering from cerebral palsy. There was no reason why this person should not be given the benefit of such, uh, uh, of, of such uh, um, provision. Especially when there was another provision in the Act, Section 42 which provides for external aids to be given to help out a person who is not able to maybe write on the blackboard or draw a diagram can certainly press a button it just makes no sense I felt uh, let us say a sense of great satisfaction in being able to deliver that judgment and I really like the way Colin went about it, and it was good. Then, well, there's really nothing that a person who is in some way hampered by some disability or the other from achieving greatness or from achieving things. All of you know the story of. Help. Note, if you can try and sort out things, the way things have been contemplated under the United Nations Convention and also under our enactments. Thank you, friends. Before we, we, we'd like to throw open the place for discussion a little later, but just before that, I think we should, or rather, we thought it this way. We'll have Chief Justice Deepak Mishra also speaking on the theme so that thereafter you could discuss the Just to make sure with you. My Lord Justice Kabir, Judge, Supreme Court of India and Adorajan Court. My Lord Justice Kabir, has uh, already spoken about this uh, disability concept and the statutory provision, the sensitivity, the perception, the sensibility, the requisite criteria from a citizen, a lawyer and a judge. But the theme that is given to me different daily high court perception is my brief. Realize most of the time, as I realized this time, that somehow in these seminars and workshops, when we come, deliberate, discuss, and analyze various situations, we tend to hold a brief and advocate for most of the people who already have some lobbying power. Of course, in all these matters, there are some victims and there are some kind of accused. But somehow, the children against whom there has been the grossest human rights violations slip out of our system. Because we never care to think that these are the children who might need our protection and for that, we could meet, deliberate, discuss and go back home a little more sensitized. We have now come of age so far as human rights, even of prisoners, are concerned. Uh, we give them various certain no rights. Justice Kabir really advocates for the juveniles. 
for example. But in our criminal justice system, which is essentially accused-centered, the victim is always forgotten. Somehow, though, there is some provision in the corner of our criminal law that victims can be heard, we don't hear them. In America, it is quite the reverse. There is the Victims of Crime Act, and that goes on the ethos of the victim's right to speak and the nation's responsibility to listen. We neither give them those rights, nor do we assume those responsibilities. This right of a victim, and especially a victim child who is never heard in our system, because our system is accused-centered and adult-oriented. So therefore, the child as a victim and a child as a child is forgotten. And this right of hearing of a child can come at four stages. The first and the most important and at which permanent damage is usually done is the stage of bail, which we take for granted. Because we believe in the right of the accused to have bail as one of our constitutional rights. The second is in recording the evidence. The third is the stage of appreciation of evidence. And the last is the stage of punishment or sentencing, which includes rehabilitation. Now, I, was, I thought I was gratified to note that in this list of agenda, we had a slot for child rights. We began with that in the morning. And whilst Mr. Justice Kabir was not there, and whilst Justice Kabir was there, and he mentioned about child rights, I thought I would intervene, and that is the brief I'm given now. I could not do it at that time, because we went on to various other matters on the agenda, for which we really discuss, because there is a lot to learn, a lot to know, and we have done a lot already. But we forgot that the grossest human rights violations are for traffic children. They are everywhere. India especially is a country which is the source, the transit and the destination country for all kinds of trafficking. Children who are trafficked are not known to anyone. They have no voice. And like yesterday I said on another context, it is for us to listen to those who cannot speak and to hear those who cannot shout. And at least if we don't do that in the court, because that does not relate to the matters that we are actually addressing, we can do it in an agenda like this. And even if other lawyers don't take it up, I would feel a lawyer as socially conscious as Mr. Colin Gonsalves and his group, I hope and feel and pray that they would take up these issues. United Nations, having its office of UNODC, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in Delhi itself, is working on it. All that it needs from us as lawyers is to give them our time. They have got very many things in place. They have got cases pending. They don't have lawyers to attend to, except the lawyers who are on the International Justice Mission. And secondly, we as judges, when matters come up before our courts, they require us to give them a special year. And that includes few aspects. One, as I said, in the first very most important stage, the stage of bail which we completely overlook and forget. Assuming, of course, that an accused is a trafficker and not otherwise, because there are many accused in a given case. And on a prima facie case being made out that the accused is a trafficker, we don't feel that this accused does not deserve not to be granted bail. We think of his human rights. We grant him the bail. And what happens is that accused goes out of our court and back into that same vehicle with that same victim girl into that same brother. And it is done over and over again. And that victim girl is intimidated into not saying anything. And therefore, when we come across any victim girl, we interview them at times. They say they are 19 years old to begin with, because they are taught and they are indoctrinated. Now therefore, this involves three aspects. One is, whilst we are considering the human rights of the accused, we have to see the human rights of the traffic victim. And under Article 23, trafficking is prohibited 
and that is a part of our fundamental right. A right of a woman never ever to be trafficked. A right of a child never to be trafficked. We talk of education and we talk of population control. But when a child is being trafficked because her parents have sold her for 10,000 rupees, or when a child is being trafficked even without that amount, there is absolutely no educational rights for the child that she can hope to have. This of course would apply even to a boy who is trafficked and brought into some brick kilns or some factories which Justice Kanguli spoke, to in the, uh, spoke about in the morning. But these are the people who cannot shout. And they require some kind of advocacy in our courts. I have come across judgments which kind of go by the board because at the first hearing bail is granted and the damage is done. The child just never gets her freedom. It is at that time that we must realize and the advocates must argue and this matter must be brought as a kind of a precedent that there is nothing like human rights of an accused vis-a-vis -vis when we are doing the power balancing of the human rights of a victim not to be trafficked. That is the first thing. The second thing is that this kind of offense is always repetitive in character. This is the accused who makes a career out of his crime. We've got a very good legislation in place which we have not used much and that is the ITPA. And that also requires the brothel itself to be sealed under the order of the magistrate. And further there is a provision specifically under section 183 of that legislation for courts not to intervene and not to grant a stay. But we are so desirous of granting a stay for everything because we think only we can hear that we grant the stay and we do the damage. If the brothel is not sealed, the brothel goes on. If the bail is not granted, the child goes straight back right into the brothel at that time. And our reference, our research has shown that one woman is susceptible to 15 rapes per night. The third aspect is the aspect of intimidation. That is the intimidation practiced by a trafficker upon a victim and you can imagine what kind of intimidation it would be that it cannot come out in her affidavit or by way of a separate representation unless some socially conscious lawyers would represent her at some time. So I thought that in a workshop of this nature I would fail in my duty if I am not even the only advocate for them. Thank you. I also personally feel that uh, this is one aspect, but it cannot be discussed. Say, uh, the short city like this. I'm if you want to discuss one hour on this. If you if you want to discuss things about juvenile justice, child trafficking, women trafficking, this by itself will need one or two days of the of the liberation. We have many things in place. Nothing needs to be. See, unless, as you said, unless you sensitize people. Anyway, um, our next speaker will be Justice Ashok Bhushan from the Hava High Court. Justice Kavit, the chairman of this session, my brothers and sisters participating in this seminar. The recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and eligible rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice and peace in the world was the pivotal theme of Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted and proclaimed by the United Nations on December 10, 1948. Even before that, but in Jawaharlal Nehru, while moving objective resolution before the Constituent Assembly on the Assembly's name, said, I quote, Very shall be guaranteed and secured to all the people of India justice, social, economic and political equality of status, of opportunity and before the law, freedom of thought, expression, belief, faith, worship, vocation, association and action subject to law and public morality. The doctrine of equality has many facets. It is a dynamic and an evolving concept. Its main facets relevant to Indian society have been referred to in the preamble and the articles under the subheading right to equality, article 14 to 18. In short, the goal is equality of status and of opportunity. Article 14 to 18 must be understood not merely with reference to what they say, but also in the light of the several articles in part 4. 
justice, social, economic and political is the sum total of the aspiration in co incorporated in part 4 of the constitution. Equality postulates not merely legal equality but also real equality. The equality of opportunity has to be distinguished from the equality of results. The various provisions of the constitution and particularly those of Article 38, 46, 335, 338 and 340 together with preamble show that the right to equality enshrined in our constitution is not merely a formal right or a vacuous declaration. It is a positive right and the state is under an obligation to undertake measures to make it real and effectual. A mere formal declaration of the right would not make unequal people. To, to compete with each other on equal plane, it is necessary to take positive measures to equip the disadvantage and handicap to bring them to the level of the fortunate advantage. Article 14, 16, no doubt, should be themselves permit such positive measures in favor of the disadvantage to make real the equality guaranteed by them. Thus, what was otherwise clear in class 1, where the expression equality of opportunity is not used, either in a formal but in a positive sense, was made explicit in class 4, so that there was no mistake in understanding either the real import of the right to equality inside the constitution or the intention of the constitution framework in that behalf. My subject for discussion being equality and non-discrimination decision from the High Court. I shall confine my dis dis discussion by referring to some decisions of Allahabad High Court. In field lunch session, our Chief Justice Justice Revelo has elaborately dealt the issue and referred to many important judgments of Allahabad High Court in this regard. I will refer only few of them. The first case which I like to refer is the case Mrs. A. Crackmail vs. State of Uttar Pradesh. In the state case, the owner of a state was a female. By notification issued by the state of UP, superintendents of the state had been taken under class B of subsection 1 of section 8 of UP Court of Wards Act 1912 without any notice and opportunity. The said section of the Court of Wards Act contained the provisions enumerating the deemed disqualification of the proprietors to manage their own property. Under class B of section 8.1, female declared by provincial government were disqualified to manage their own property. Section 8.2 of the Act provided, I quote, no declaration under class D of subsection 1 shall be made until the proprietor has been furnished with a detailed statement of the ground on which it was proposed to disqualify him and has had an opportunity of showing cause why such a declaration should be made. Before the High Court it was submitted that there is a clear distribution between a female proprietor and male proprietor. Whereas section 8.2 contemplates giving an opportunity of showing cause before issuing any such declaration, but no such opportunity is provided for a female proprietor. The division bench ruled out that the section 8.1b is void and held that this was a case of clear discrimination. Another case of Abdul Wahid Khan versus Chief Justice High Court of Judicature at Allahabad, a notification was issued by the state government upgrading the pay scale of the staff of the High Court. The notification however provided that permanent staff will get the revised pay scale but for temporary uh, employees they have to pass an examination conducted by the Public Service Commission. That the court held that this is a case of clear discrimination. There cannot be any dis discrimination of, uh, for the purpose which has been said in the notification. High Court said that the, from the point of view of achieving the object of improving the efficiency, the permanent and the temporary employee would stand on an identical footing. They both are in the same class and they should not be treated differently. The classification between permanent and temporary employee has no relation, much less a reasonable land to the object intended to be achieved by the notification. The provision in the notification of passing the qualifying test to be conducted by commission was based on a constitutional impermissible classification. Before another judgment of the High Court, Mrs. Raghunandan Prasad Mohalla vs. Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. The, when the new Act 1961 Act came, there was a provision in Section 297 which provided for the penalty which, uh, and the section provided that those persons with regard to whom assessment is made before 1st April 62, they will be dealt with the old Act and those, for those whose assessment is made after uh, the 1st April 62, they will be dealt with uh, new Act. Then the court held 
they are prevented from taking action against them or doing something. So those who are not uh, Lester said in the, in the part of it, what we are doing is the other part of it, not the first part, we can't do that. But the courts in UP have been proactive for the last about 15 years in protect, protecting such runaway marriages. But you ask me what is this jurisdiction? Well, strictly speaking, it not be able to put it around legally. But we have been proactive and we are doing it and we have stopped many on the killing in the state of India. Will it come on the address or first? No, it can come both on the article 1, 2, 26. 24, we are using 21 basically, otherwise that, 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 to be, it held, be used to be used to 2021 for the exact legal parameters. But how, how do people know this? You know, I mean, there's a young girl track, God knows where. It, it's always well known to the public. It's a, a code or something to get you there. Or no, no, no. Th th these are young couples who marry and come to us for protection. They are adults. And the okay. child, they have to come to the court. What are they applying? The right. idea is the soda for Indian constitution. <coughs> Article 14 declares that everyone is equal before law and everyone shall have equal treatment at law. Post-independence, who had a very dramatic social conditions. The society was splintered. Caste-wise, there were uh, different uh, gradations. Uh, and then uh, everyone was not equal in the post-independence. Maybe in the British rules, some of the proactive sure to see that the every citizen of the country shall give shall be given the equality. <coughs> In that context, uh, we the constitution itself found out there are marginalized sections, namely scheduled caste and children, because we have got right of right of uh, this exploitation is children exploitation is banned, trafficking is banned, and then law declares that all are equal before law. Therefore, the social hierarchy or the caste hierarchies, everything got abolished. After the advent of the constitution, everyone is equal before law. And all the legislations, the, we have got this, uh, the woman, uh, she is subjected to so many uh, social disabilities. The institutional structure both combined in the constitution. Some states have got